Uh, this is uh, Sydney, the William B. Daly sculpture, uh, or statue, sorry, in Hyde Park. Uh, a few important points, and I'll get to uh, them eventually, but basically it's going to be about, well, obelisks and stone moving and masonry and the connections to Freemasons. So, for instance, um, William B. Daly was uh, a Freemason in the Southern Cross Lodge. But um, now we have free and accepted Masons, but all uh, well, the origins is in the name Masonry and people who were masters of working with stone, and that's where we'll point to. But uh, sort of touched on it in earlier videos, but I still, because there will, there will be a point in connections, we're going to go through to uh, London, New York, Paris, Egypt, and Lebanon. But so the um, William B. Daly statue had the winged disc and with the snakes. This is uh, not far away. Also in Hyde Park, Sydney is the uh, the other obelisk, which was um, it's actually a sewer event. But uh, and w that's one of the reasons why it has this uh, metal capstone on it because yeah, it's it's a it's a vent essentially. But uh, but it also has the same. Uh, well, the winged disc again, which very much connects to Isis and uh, some um, Egyptian mythology. But you also notice so we have the winged disc, but we also have it guarded by sphinxes. And this will bring us to a series of connections. And there is, I am leading to a point, and it's got to do very much with masonry, both modern and ancient. But anyway, the winged disc guarded by sphinx, uh, the H Hyde Park obelisk on Elizabeth Street, Sydney. Well, this, the Sydney obelisk was a... Um, uh, connected to, well just like the, uh, this is Cleopatra's needle in London and they share more than a few things. Well for instance they have, they're guarded by sphinxes but in this case they're on the, f on the ground and we have the w winged disc again. So we have this Egyptian symbolism but the important point, so the sculptures and that collar with, with the winged disc, these are new, uh, like well relatively new but Cleopatra's needle in London is uh, from the ancient city of Heliopolis. It was moved by Cleopatra around about uh, first century BC, and it was moved to Alexandria. Uh, but uh, anyway, so okay, Dandera Temple in Egypt again. So we see the winged disc with the snakes and the winged disc with the scarab. Again, it's well, uh, this one will not be about Egyptian mythology, but so you can just follow anyway the pictures. And, uh, well, it's a strong connection to, well, basically their uh, homage, to, uh, the Sydney obelisk, and the, which is a modern obelisk, and not a true obelisk, it's made of many pieces of stone, the Cleopatra's needle. Here we see it being raised. Now, it's, not only was it transported from Alexandria by a ship, it was then lifted and then set upright, and it's over 220 tonnes of weight. So this is uh, this was done in um, eighteen seventy eight, raising the obelisk. Uh, was the, the picture sort of done? Sorry, I forget the exact date the obelisk was set, but it, yeah, it's a, a massive piece of stone. It's uh, just under twenty two meters, so we're talking about sixty sixty six uh, seventy feet, massive. Now. Um, but, but also the Sydney obelisk, that winged disc, now there was, for instance, there was a coin printed uh, which has Cleopatra's needle in London, but you'll see that this is an Australian coin, but you'll see also it has the Dendera Zodiac. So there's another nice little connection to um, Dendera Zodiac. Robert Bouval done some excellent stuff on this, and it was uh, his stories of how he um, combated the establishment in regards to certain things. It's, uh, it's funny and sad, uh, but anyway... Dendera, uh, ancient Egypt, and obelisks. Now we have there are two Cleopatra's needles. Now they were not made for Cleopatra; they were simply moved by Cleopatra from Heliopolis to Alexandria. We have one in London, and we have the other in New York. Cleopatra's needle in New York. Now it's in a famous location. Uh, if you've seen Scott Onstott Secrets in Plain Sight, he mentions it's um, a very important placement inside Central Park in New York. And uh, so there on the bottom left, the uh, Metropolitan Museum, uh, which also houses a uh, uh, Temple of Isis, which was relocated also from Egypt. This is the last surviving, this is in Cairo, in the ancient city, what was then Heliopolis. This is the last surviving of those obelisks. There were many, but they've been moved around the world. Some are in London, uh, one in London, 
one in New York and many, many in uh, Rome. And they were moved, uh, Roman emperors began the moving of them. But anyway, um, it's often said that the Great Pyramid is 30 degrees north. Well, it's not. The Great Pyramids are aligned to Heliopolis, and Heliopolis is exactly 30 degrees north. All these numbers you might be familiar with if you've seen recent videos. Very important point. Uh, recent scans have shown that the Great Pyramids are indeed pointed at Heliopolis. Whether intentional or not, it is a fact that they are arranged there. Back to New York. This is Cleopatra's Needle in New York. Unlike uh, the... Cleopatra's Needle in London, it doesn't have the winged discs around there as a slight variation, but that's a nice interesting point. Here's the plaque described how it was moved from Alexandria, but it was originally situated, situated in Heliopolis in Cairo. Heliopolis was the centre of Egyptian mystery schools. This is a picture of the obelisk uh, as it was in Alexandria. This is uh, Cleopatra's Needle, New York. Uh, Cleopatra's Needle in London had fallen over, was buried in sand, but anyway, so... This is how the, the obelisk was moved. The ship had to specially be uh, made to allow, allow it to be moved in and out. Another reference to Freeman. So this is the, the where they were setting the stone for Cleopatra's Needle in New York. This was the Masonic ceremony to do with it. Now, um, very important, like uh, Masonic rituals and ceremonies in buildings and constructions. Very. I'll get in. I'll do a fuller video on that hopefully in the future. But here we see the obelisk after it's been removed from ship and as it was moving towards the site and how it was lifted. Now this is um, late 1800s, uh, crane technology like we think that, well, was pretty basic but we're talking 220 tonnes being lifted and shifted. So it's not just about the pure lift, it's also about moving the stones. Now eventually it was brought to Central Park and this is how it's shown. Now you can see some basic uh, lifting equipment, lifting technology was used to place these, not only lift them, to, to, to swing them and then to place them on their location. A uh, little link there, so okay, um, Cleopatra's Needle in New York, we see around the corner, supporting the corners, we see the crabs. Now there's a, uh, the scarab and the crab can actually be interchanged, it depends on what culture you're talking about. So we see the winged disc on Cleopatra's Needle, needle in London and we see the scarabs on uh, of a crab, uh, cancer, um, sometimes called the scarab, in the southern hemisphere it's often referred to as a scarab, so they actually are um, brought in, so one's a dung beetle, one's a crab, but they do have connections. Now, over to Paris, in the Place de la Concorde, this was also an uh, ancient Egyptian obelisk, and it was brought from the Temple of Luxor. So this is the temple entrance now, and we can see on the left-hand side that's the twin of the one in Paris, and this was just, you know, this is what it would look like if it was originally, you know, that I've just photoshopped that in just to show. So the, that's the Paris obelisk and how it would be compared to its twin. Interestingly, it's one of these that are 82 feet, 27.3. Uh, ancient sites across the world still to this day, especially with Masonic connections, are using this number 27.3, very important. But that's not the point for this video. The point is that this obelisk, in a similar fashion, are uh, pre modern cranes using timber and rope and manpower, pulleys, A frames, was able to be lifted. And that's over 250 tons, 75 feet as it stands now. Uh, but this it was how it was lifted. Now, 250 tons, that's nothing to scoff at, but we'll get to some heavier weights and how, uh, again, in, uh, even prior to this, much larger, ob heavier obelisks were being lifted. Uh, the Latran obelisk in Rome. Rome has many Egyptian obelisks, and, they, and the Roman emperors started bringing them in. Now, for instance, this one, we can even see a depiction of some of the mechanics being used to lift them. Again, you can even get the, well, block and tackle once again, these lifting technologies to where one man can lift many, many, many times his own weight. Many men can lift a huge amount. And so, for instance, the obelisk itself fell over, was re-erected in 1587 by Pope uh, Sixtus V, Pope Sixtus V, nice connection. Uh, but it, the earlier version was brought by Constantinus uh, II in the um, third century, and it was 400, over 400 tons originally. The current obelisk lost some weight because it was damaged in the break. But here we see again, in, so from the 1500s, how it was lifted. Over to Jerusalem, 
the, the temple walls of Herod. So the first century, uh, for basically around the year zero, uh, we see these massive stones that were perfectly laid and brought in place. So during the Roman era, we see these huge, huge stones cut beautifully, which is not in itself too hard, but also being lifted and placed and placed with a very high precision. So this was in you know smack bang in the middle of the Roman period, Julius Caesar, Cleopatra, Mark Anthony, etc. Um, recently some footage emerged. This is Lee, Leonard, uh, sorry, Ed Seed Scallion, the Coral Castle. He's using an A-frame and a block and tackle to lift his stones. One man can lift those, uh, like the largest stone there was 13 ton. 13 ton is minuscule weight to lift. The footage and the pictures show him using, again, this uh, chain hoist, a block and tackle. So one man can easily lift those stones. An uh, A-frame can easily support that weight. Not a problem at all. Uh, you go down to your hardware shop, any mechanic worth his salt will have a, a chain block such as this. This is a one ton chain block. You can get two ton, five ton, ten ton, much heavier. I used to work in this industry. Uh, this is a 100 ton uh, chain block. The chain on the left hand side is one man can pull on that and lift 100 tons. One man can lift 100 tons using this technology. We think, well, this is modern. No, it's not. It's old technology for instance this is a, a, a simple well, a earlier simple block and tackle this would be used again by uh, carpenters construction teams going back so, uh, sailing ships um, for instance to lift that heavy rigging a few sailors could lift several times their own weight and they used a block and tackle each time you increase the number of uh, of pulleys you have the, uh, have the effort needed to lift the weight uh, this is a, like a, a, a block from a sailing ship. They loop the ropes around there. Each time you loop it, it halves the weight. You just have to pull the rope twice as much. Ancient technology, very simple. Uh, you know, still being used to now because of uh, you know we have more like gears and it's sort of hidden with inside the housing, but not a problem to lift massive weights. Okay, so now if we go back and well, we have Cleopatra's needle in New York City. It's literally an act of masonry the connections with the freemasons and so well, there are of course many on a symbolic level but also in the practical element of masonry now modern masons for, for, uh, you know, accepted masons are not strictly stone masons but the origins of this craft is built in you know strictly speaking stone masonry that's uh, going back to the craft guilds or mystery schools as they were called US Capitol building foundation stone set with an A-frame this is a picture from uh, Sydney Masonic uh, Centre Museum we see the A-frame block and tackle and uh, a geared winch as well so uh, using mechanical advantage one person can lift and control very easily control a large large amount of weights this is not out there this is you know basic physics 101 it's been applied for centuries and centuries but staying on the masonic theme uh, that's because of solomon's temple and the, well solomon's temple the legend of that and the legend of king hiram is uh, a very important part within freemasons so king solomon uh, sent for the assistance of king hiram of tyre this is in the 10th century BC, so uh, uh, basically a thousand years before the peak of the Roman period, 1300 years before the Romans brought the Lateran obelisk to Rome and erected that 450 tons, lifted, shifted and set precisely. King Hiram of Tyre, well, what was his kingdom, where was the area? Well it was in Lebanon, Red Cedar. The, the Red Cedar columns were a famous part of King Solomon's temple. He trained the stonemasons. Um, only a, a Jewish priest was an, allowed in the precinct so they had to be trained and they were trained by King Hiram. It's mentioned in the Bible, it's mentioned in the Masonic Dictionary and so if we bring up a map we, we still have the current city of Tyre, uh, Baalbek, very uh, not too far to the north and again not so far to Jerusalem but this is a 10th century BC so the exact date of when the large stones were moved in Baalbek we know it was pre-Roman but the exact date it's unknown we um it, it could be that uh, it was actually if not King Hiram or he had direct uh, he was an ancestor of the people who built it uh, so again in the first uh, century BC uh, King Herod built these walls, 520 tons. 
why I bring this picture back up. Uh, well, firstly, it was a massive effort. They were perfectly, not, well, beautifully aligned, beautifully carved, beautifully set. Now, it's often said, it's been said, that a crane cannot lift these. Well, there are different types of cranes, but a mobile crane, the largest uh, in the world, can lift 1,200 tonnes. So it's just untrue that these stones cannot be lifted. We see even from um, uh, ancient carvings that they were using a block and tackle, as well as a, a, a wheel. To, again, just like you know, to, the mechanical advantage, it's possible to lift these stones with very little effort. It's Again, it's sort of lifting 101. But then also the question is, well, uh, when they bring up cranes, people will tend to bring up the extended boom crane, but that's like lifting a weight out to the side. What, when you lift a weight, you lift, you know, you, especially if you lift a heavy weight, you stand over it and lift it directly up. More like a gantry crane, and the biggest gantry cranes can hold, well, over 20,000 tonnes. That's 15 um, of, uh, well, many, many times over the crane. So we see an example, you lift from the centre of gravity, you don't lift out. So it's often the use of these extended uh, crane arms is really bad. It's not, you know, it's pretty pretty embarrassing in many cases. But, uh, and again, so the, the, the larger stones, the largest is the stone of Janine, probably around 1,600 tonnes, depending on what type of limestone it is. I think that they often use the wrong um, density of limestone and they're probably actually lighter than that but let's give them the advantage on that and this is often a picture used um, in the thing saying well it can't be lifted it's impossible blah 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 well this is just wrong this is like so cringeworthy wrong that it's yeah it's it's embarrassing it's laughably embarrassing bad but you know this is those are the type of cranes to lift pools into backyards the uh, one crane, one extended boom arm crane can lift and shift the stone. Um, uh, for instance, the pregnant mother could be lifted and shifted with a large crane. Now, of course, they didn't have these cranes back then. That's not the point, and we'll get to that in a moment. But it's just, again, this uh, persistent narrative that, well, we can't do it. Even now, we can't do it. Well, BS, we can do it. We can do it, you know, easily, easily. It's not, um, especially, well, a gantry crane could lift basically all of those big stones all at once so again these types of depictions are just wrong it's it's an urban legend they shouldn't be selling it and quite frankly people shouldn't be buying it now it's often said that these are the largest um, the bulbic stones are the largest stones to be ever to be moved now that's different from lifting and again we'll get to that in a moment but even this is strictly speaking probably not true and we'll, we'll have a look at that in a moment. But um, even if they were the largest stones ever moved, well, we have the Thunderstone in Russia that was originally about 20,000 tonnes. It was slightly reduced and shaped. And, but when they began, when the move began, it was over 1,500 tonnes. So the Stone of Janine at 1,600, this is 1,500. So we're splitting hairs here. So even if the Thunderstone was not the largest stone ever moved, it was it was moved by man. There are plenty of documents in regards to this. Uh, in, of course, these depictions, and they show, and and Catherine ordered that the stone be moved immediately, and that they carve it and shape it on on route. So it took to move it four miles. That's an important point. It took, well, using mechanical advantage, it took a surprisingly surprisingly small amount of men. The stone was carved en route because Catherine wanted to prove her point and this was a technological marvel. Uh, there were even documents of ambassadors, uh, other people visiting. So you know, this is a... Now, it was moved four miles to the coast. It was reduced and here we see so the stone was much smaller by the time it was brought to the barge. And as we'll see, the final stone, it's, you know, even this is a very accurate depiction of what the final stone was moved. So by the time it was put on the barge it was 400 tons that was and, and then warships sailed it again this is again you know uh, water displacement it's not a problem to carry that onto the barge and here we see the final stone which is much less reduced <coughs> pardon still 400 tons um, shifted and moved so uh, and that was done without animals it was done without steam power or, or any any sort of advantage in that it was done with rails and it was done with capstans or you know essentially uh, blocks and tackles to, and uh, powered by capstans so 
uh, and uh, uh, bronze spheres as ball bearings as well to, to make it even easier. So uh, a lot of this stuff that you, you cannot move, we cannot lift these stones, it's it's really just bollocks. Um, and so yeah, so the, the, the large stones at Baalbek well, could be lifted by modern equipment but the problem is that's not the issue that they could be lifted. The issue is why would you even bother to lift it? Now we could build even bigger cranes but it's uh, people are smart enough not to make massive weights will build things in a more modular style so it's not economically viable but the point is why would you lift something when you can slide it? It's a perfect example is your sofa at home. You don't lift it up, you slide it across. Uh, another like example is you know that, that's the same principle now that's a massive amount of timber and weights there's no way that those horses you know e with a simple pulley could lift those weights up but they could you know they can drag it slide it across that's you know again that's you know, sort of physics 101 in regards to this even up uh, a slight incline as long as it's not too steep it wouldn't be a problem now this comes back to again I posted recent video into this we find these um, stones in Baalbek are at a certain angle and they've been carved that way and you can see from the shape of the stone around it was not necessary they did this with intent this was done with intent this was done on purpose this was done for a reason and this also points to uh, another example of how they were shifted so here's a, again another example the stone is on the angle this is not just due to the stone being uh, erosion and it tilting down no, nah, that's just, you know, we, we can see the stones carved in situ. Now, here's a map, so where were they delivered to the temple complex? And f and we see marked, uh, I've got two of the stones marked there, so you see earlier, but the, for instance, the pregnant mother, 1,200 tonnes. The stones in a temple complex are 800 tonnes, so that's again, needs to be taken into account. But the distance from there is less than a mile, so roughly around a kilometre, depends on what point of the location. This in itself is very important because just like the Thunderstone was, was moved four miles across marshland. So they waited until winter, till the dry, um, in the colder months, and then once they got it onto more solid ground, they were able to move it and, and the ground supports the weight, supports huge weights. But another point is that the quarry site is level or slightly higher than the, the temple complex and the destiny, you know. So gravity... Uh, would not be fighting you and at some points it will be actually assisting you so again we don't lift the stone S see how it's carved they carve out this groove underneath now uh, rollers seems to be to the go-to explanation and rollers is not good because well there's many problems with that but what you, you could use just um, you could use a, a rail or a sled and we'll have a an example but um, and I'll get back to this okay so I'm going to start a video now showing just an in principle example surface of the board is wet it will slide so much easier so you need to hold it all the time never release it when the board is wet the other extreme is when the stone is too heavy and it won't slide because it creates too much friction and you can help that a little bit by using a simple and old stonemason's trick that I learned from those people that you know did it in the old school way I'll show you how that works Very simple, you just take the sand, put it over the wooden board, and the sand will work like a bearing. You see that? How quick that came down there? That's it, that is how it works. Because sometimes, really, the stone can be so heavy that it will become hard to handle it. And that's the reason why I'm doing this here. Actually, I have difficulties to stop the stone from sliding too far down to the ground. So, it's going to catch it. so although this video was on a small scale, he was one man moving one... Uh, one stone, but also in, the wood was basically unsupported in the middle, it was able to take the weight. Um, but the important point is, you know, he learnt this old mason's trick with a bit of water and a bit of sand, and just like a train, 
um, still will, on a steep grade will release sand to get grip or to help slow it down. These are old tricks, ancient tricks used by the old timers. Now, w w our internet age, we tend to look for complex technological solutions for apparently complex problems, but it's not the point. We can find answers looking to it and thinking in the older times, the older scales, and looking to their older knowledge. Now, for instance, why was the, carve, uh, the stone carved in that way? So you could insert a rail. Why was it cut at that angle? To help you to give the initial movement. Um, it's the, the grade itself is pretty much, well, depending on the, the site, it's between um, a level or slightly higher. So gravity, again, gravity is by co-pilot. Gravity will help you pull, slide the, the, the stone down. It's, you would never have to lift it. You would only have to slide it and you would be assisted or at least not gravity would not be fighting you. So you would need a very small amount of effort in comparison. So when people say 1,200 or 800 tonnes in these smaller stones, uh, it, you don't need that force to shift it. It's the same with lifting a sofa or, or, or sliding a sofa. This is, you know, it's, you, you've, you've done it, at, I'm sure you've done it at home, so that needs to be kept in mind. But in terms of even lifting, so for instance, 330 tonnes in 1587, the Lateran, Lateran obelisk, but Roman emperors in the 4th century AD, uh, it was originally 450 tonnes. It fell over and then the Pope Sixtus V re-erected it and there some pieces that the broken, broken so it lost some height. But the earlier version lifted, twisted and... Um, and set in place this 450 tons is is over half the weight of the stones in uh, in the uh, temple complex in Baalbek they were lifted spun and moved around and placed with a high level of accuracy so again these uh, modern cranes could do it but again you don't need modern cranes there are plenty of examples such as the uh, Cleopatra's needle, the Luxor obelisk, which show that the principle is quite true. Now, as a part, we have well, King Hiram of Tyre. He basically the ancestor of the Phoenicians uh, who built the temple foundations earlier. Possibly a uh, very close ancestor. Possibly it might have been done in his time. Now that's just speculation. So we, we, the exact date is unsure, but that was his he would have known about these things he was a master mason to you know to build solomon's he taught other people he had the lebanese red cedar which could easily support this weight so this argument that the the wood would collapse it's 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 a furphy uh, these stones never had to be lifted they they was they could was slid into place. Now I'm going to say they were because we don't know exactly how it was done but they were smart enough not to lift you know, like it's, why would you? Why, you know, like they're not stupid. They obviously put these things up. They know what they're doing and you don't need to lift. Now, these stones are high. You can see them now. They've put up to a certain height. But again, the position of the quarry would allow for this. You you wouldn't even necessarily need, need to lift them. But if you did, it would not be impossible. And it would be very, it's very possible with very simple well-known techniques now um, so again we have the the quarry site or one of the quarry sites but where we have the pregnant mother and these other uh, massive massive stones now the, the actual stones in the temple complex were only 800 tons and we've seen examples of, of that where it, that's not impossible to lift that weight at all without mechanical uh, without engines or, or that type of assistance. It's using mechanical advantage, using the technology and know-how of what sailors use. So, uh, simple, so again, it's to slide these in um, with, the, with the red cedar and an earthen bank. There are all different ways to do it. This is just, a, a, just a, an example to show. Okay, so it's not a problem at all to get that in there. Um, a relatively small amount of men using very simple equipment which was you know again uh, there are depictions of it in the Roman era Greeks knew about these types of things and how to how to get mechanical advantage again it's 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 this is ancient tech technology you know people quickly learn um, you know if you're cutting would you get good at cutting you can you can learn to split the knots uh, split the the grain and and well you learn very quickly when you're forced to when you don't have um, 
yeah, it, people learn out of necessity and, uh, you know, necessity is the mother of all invention. This is a video from Wally Wallington. He's reconstructing Stonehenge. One man is lifting a 20-ton block. The same exact principle could be used on larger stones. You would just need a couple more men. And so, again, this is not, uh, that's one man on 20 tons. Now, you say, well, the stones there are 1,200 tons. Well, that's, that's, that's no problem. It's just scaling things up. Give me a le lever long enough and I shall move the earth. Now, for instance, we brought the stone to site. Gravity, you know, we've used even gravity to assist us. Using that technique of Wally Wallington, we could lift these stones ever so slightly. Then we just need to lever them or, or using an A-frame. Again, mechanical advantage, blocks and levers and an A-frame. And we can, once the corner is on the base, the weight is supported. We don't have to lift the entire weight. We only have to lift a small portion of it and using a bit of know-how, very simple tools, very simple. We could roll it onto there or we could just lever it across as well. So that's another possibility. Now, exactly how it was done, I don't know. But to say it cannot be done, that's untrue. It can be done quite easily. That's And that's, I choose those words, quite easily. It's just a matter of willpower and scaling up simple demonstrations. Here's like another Wally Wallington. He's using a pebble to move massive stones with a single lever just by finding the center of gravity. Again, simple know-how, very simple. Now, uh, the unfinished obelisk in Aswan, it's over 120 feet. This this is even bigger than the biggest stones in Bar Well, it was never finished because it was cracked and it was damaged. Well, how did they do, do? They didn't need some sort of magical lightning from the fingers, Jedi force power to do these things. Now, Wally gives another excellent example of how it's to be done. So he's used the stone, he's found the center of gravity, he's levered it up. Now he has the stone sitting on the earth where he's created a pit of sand. Simply by washing away the sand or shoveling it out, you can carefully drop the stone into place. And again, the final step to get it accurate, you just need an A-frame because you don't have to support the whole weight. You only have to support a portion of the weight. With a block and tackle, even those tonnage is not a problem. So how would the larger obelisk, is a, like a diagram as, as an example, we're not sure again, but can it be done? Yes, it can, and it's using this very simple, these are the materials at hand. You don't have to bring in expensive stuff from out there. You use what's available, that's the best way to work. What's the you know, when you're building a, a stone uh, wall, which is the best stone to use? The one in your hand, as I, I heard, uh, I've heard a quote talking. Okay, so old mason knowledge. Um, again, who are you going to look at what the Masons did in the past? And now, not just talking about the secret society of Freemasons, just using them as an example because they have their heritage in the Masonic world. We have the Thunderstone. Now, there is plenty of documentation to, to uh, talking about this, you know, uh, even the decrypt. Now, these are, these are paintings, these are not photographs. Well, you, you, could, you could Photoshop as well, so if, even if a photo, but anyway. Um, the descriptions, the work orders are all, you know, still in storage. Catherine the Great was quite proud of it. Um, it this was, you know, ad, if not the biggest, it was equal to the, the um, larger than the pregnant mother, largest. It was larger than all of the stones at Baalbek except for one, the stone of Janine. And even that's slightly debatable because it depends on the density of the, of the limestone there. The, this is red granite. Red granite is much heavier per square foot as opposed to limestone depending on uh, which version you're using. Uh, lifting, swiveling and putting in position Cleopatra's needle or Cleopatra's needle in London or the Luxor obelisk. The principle is there so it's just a matter of scaling it up. So, And this is well again well documented. It's you know it's not some lost ancient technology it's just forgotten because we're you know we're so used to just you know, you call up a crane to lift something and do these types of things. You know, we've we've we're 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 losing the old skills um, from you know agriculture. Well, basically every craft, every trade. You know, three D printing and um, it's destroyed this this old knowledge. But it's it's there. It's still there. It's traceable. It's you know, it's quite there. Back to ancient times, they had a blocks and tackle. They knew about. Um, these things, even before the Romans, the Greeks knew, and, that, and they left good documents in regards to that. So we've, without a time machine, um, like in the oldest parts of ancient history, we'll never know exactly 
how it was done. Now we have some, but the point is we know it can be done. It's a matter of time and it's a matter of willpower. Uh, we have such short attention spans, we can't see beyond our generation. Now, that, a couple of generations ago, that was a, we had a, people had a very different viewpoint. They looked in a more generational scale. The great cathedrals of Europe were built over centuries, people looking ahead of their own time. It's about working smart, not working hard. Why lift something heavy when you can shift it, when you can slide it? Instead of why fighting gravity, why not use gravity to assist you? Why not use, well, for instance, Wally Wellington is a perfect example. You find the center of gravity of this big stone and you can move them easily. One person can move a massive stone. All you've got to do is, a few people can move even a larger stone. A few people with a block and tackle can move massive amounts of stone. So I spent quite a bit of time against the establishment view of history and I stand by that. Uh, it, it is, it's so much BS. Um, however, there's so much of that same on the c counterpoint. Now, this is I'm going from one extreme to the other, but you know, like it, this is sort of gaining traction that uh, everything's ancient aliens and stuff. Well, it's just nonsense. It's 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 patently false. And uh, now, possibly the Egyptians did have anti-gravity technology. I don't know that they did not, but I know that they can achieve all those things they did with some simple tools and with time and willpower and there's just too much of this going around in regards to these topics. Human beings are amazing creatures, we can achieve amazing things. The Wright brothers uh, within the 70 years will, you know, the Saturn V rockets. It's only a matter of, of will and a matter of belief in oneself. The only limits on, a human, achieve, on human achievement are self-imposed. So true, if you say you cannot do it, you never will. But if you say, yes we can, yes I can, it can be done now in politics that's a different thing but when it comes to you know, well even politics would apply but you know uh, uh, anyway success kid you know i think it's a great because you've got water you've got sand with some wood and some rope he, he achieves success it's a matter you know it's about applying some basic equipment some basic knowledge and just having the willpower and determination to go through it with it rather than believe in the extreme believe in yourself because just like your ancestors you can achieve amazing things anyway with that i hope you enjoyed have a good one i know this might not be well received but you got to tell the truth you gotta, and and here it is so have a good one